morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to continue our study uh, dealing with uh, Judges. We're going to move into Judges chapter 4. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? The dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful again that we can come together and review the light that you have given us and to see new light for our, for our path. We just pray for each person that you can help them with their particular needs and struggles that they face each day. May your Holy Spirit be here to teach us. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so um, we, we finished Shamgar, but I just want to just review that a little bit. Um, so after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. So that verse can produce an entire line. And um, so if we just go there quickly, add a couple little details. Um, so I, I put in there, in that first way mark, line upon line. That's the presentation in Devon, Alberta on October 5th, 2012, where I deal with line upon line. And, but each of these, these words, sword, that Shamgar, son of Anath, that's answer, slew, the Hebrew number there, in reverse is December 25th, and Noel presents on June 22nd. Um, and then we have uh, the camp meeting where I present time, the second message arriving. And we have the 600 men representing symbols of time, 365, the number of days in a year, 235, the number of months in a metonic cycle. You divide them, you get the 391 and the 666 symbol. Both are things that I presented in that camp meeting. I presented the 391 years of, um, of the prophecy of, well, Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 4 to 6. And also I presented the 666 year span from captivity of Jehoiachin to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And I have that 777. Now this is related of course to this June 22nd, 2014 date. And I probably should have a note there though we do look at this in other lines. Um, but this Mayan date is, um, uh, the number of days from this Mayan date to June 22nd, I think it's like 548 days. And if you go back 548 days, it brings you to June 22nd, 2011. And these are the two dates that Jeff noted. Um, so this other message relates specifically to this chronology. We have the July 16th date that's going to... Um, Again, address Ezekiel, but its connection with Revelation 9. September 23rd is going to be Samuel Snow's letters and the symbol of July 18, 2020. And October 13th, 2018 is this third message arriving. And you can see the ox, which, which is for plowing, the goad, which represents teaching, and delivered, which means to be open. So this, this light is opened, all this light here. And this darkness was the Sunday law prediction of Parminder. And this is light that comes in reaction to Parminder's time setting and undoes it. And the July 18, 2020 date, of course, is a repeat of history. And, and that's all a way mark in and of itself. So we're not zooming into that one presently. Um, though, if we look at the next way mark, um, so or the not the next way mark, the next line that we're going to address is going to be Deborah and Barak. And this is also going to be the formalization of the first angel's message in the line of the judges that we see above. So we see the judges line. We know that Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar related to um, the arrival of the first message. That is, it's a zoom into 9-11 on this line. And this is a zoom into the October 13th September 7th date, that is, it's going to zoom into that uh, Levitical chiasm, at least part of it. 
right? It's not going to complete that Levitical chiasm. And this is going to be the 777 days prior to uh, November 9th, 2019. So it's going to, so it's a period of 777 days, but it's a different period of 777 days. <clears throat> so in the line above, we uh, had intimated uh, just because of those two dates, the 77 days and the 777 days, even though those are on other lines. But anyway, so here with Deborah and Brack, we're going to go through this line. So it's, it's the formalization of that previous message. So if that message was about the darkness of Parminder in time setting, this line is going to be the darkness of organization. And um, so we will see how uh, this relates to Parminder. And we, we've gone through it a few times. So we're, this is just a review to add in the details um, that we need. Um, just so that we can uh, recount this, study it out, and also uh, when we present it to others um, who haven't studied it out. Um, so that they can they can see what what we're speaking of here. So, um, any any comments about the previous line? Were people satisfied with Shamgar that we could take that single verse, draw out this line, and um, we are addressing, of course, that there's an increase of knowledge that comes. So. There's, there's lots of things in this line, lots of details, I guess, we could add, but. It seems pretty good. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, informative. And then as the presenter puts it out, uh, can make it more comprehensive to those that haven't been following. Mm -hmm. See, you know, part of this is this is our history of this movement. Right. And so it should be known. It should be known. But, you know, I don't think we know our history. I mean, for the most part, that people are unfamiliar with. I mean, they may have heard about different things. But I don't think we understand the significance of how these events are connected. Because there is a progression of light that has come to this movement. That's what um, we're seeing in these lines of the judges, right? Because this is a reform line. And, and we start here specifically with the judges. We're addressing a particular darkness that has to do with our own lines. That is, understanding the lines themselves is really what the story of the judges is. And aside from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that first gave us this clear understanding of how we could uh, take any waymark and create a reform line from it, um, this is something that is not understood. That is, prior to 9-11, we had an understanding of the lines that was given to us. That is God gave us a structure, right? Yes. But he gave us this line upon line structure. But after 9-11 is when we actually unpackage it, right? It's it's the, the scroll is unsealed and opened. So 9-11 becomes that key. A message arrives that's going to help us understand really how we're repeating Millerite history. Because Jeff has this idea prior to 9-11. You know, that we're, we're repeating Mill Millerite history. That the first and second angel's messages need to be repeated. And he has a structure that's given to him, this line upon line method. But he hasn't really understood it. And, and that's what's going to be happening with this um, events from 9-11. Uh, we begin to open up that understanding so that um, when we get to 2010, we're going to have this, this message 
Um, and here I'm just looking Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. I'm looking at the wrong line. I want to look at this line. So, so we get this open so that by the time we get to uh, July 18th, we have a second message, right? So 9-11 and 11-9 are tied together here, right? But then when we get to July 18th, we now have another expansion in our understanding, right? And that, so that's what the judge's line is. It's, it's this understanding to... 2023 that opens up. So this is the understanding of the lines. And so we can say that we understand the lines now. We understand how they work. We can construct them. Um, that is, we can see them in the stories of the Bible, and we can understand, you know, how they're connected. We can start to discern the layers of these lines. So you know, when we first started trying to construct these lines from the lines of judges, first we just went through and uh, we noted the symbols, right? So we, we could see the symbols, we could see, we just kind of marked the events in our history. We went through it again, we started to draw them on a line. So we could we could have this, this, this line, this structure, and now we can we can see how they're all interrelated much more clear with the other lines. Okay, so uh, let's go to chapter four. <clears throat> now we know that um, in chapter four, so I just got to change my screen here. Um, the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. So that means Shamgar is not... Um, you know, there isn't a continuation. Shamgar doesn't give us any span of time. And Shamgar is in the West, dealing with the Philistines. So, so we're moving back to um, uh, the East. This is actually going to be a bit more North, right? Um, but it's in different areas. But it's, it's definitely not on the coast in the West. It's not by the Philistines. And um, and this is going to be Jabin, king of Canaan, who's going to be the oppressor. Oppressor, but he has his captain, who is Sisera, and we know that these represent messages. So we know that Sisera came to represent Parminder's message. Now it's Parminder's message that's actually going to be addressed, um, which we didn't we didn't look at particularly. We talked about it, but. A lot of it has to do with the organization that he is presenting. It's, maybe that's not the best way to describe it, but Parminder was presenting a method of study and he was presenting this idea that this church needs to organize. Now, I don't know how many people would remember this or know about this, um, but, but why did why did Jeff decide that the movement needed to organize? Does anybody know why they started organization? No, that eludes me. <laughs> now, it was Parminder that actually proposed it, from what I remember, is that he was trying to illustrate in the lines that the movement needs to organize. And this he took from Millerite history um, or early Adventist history. Now, now, I had problems with this right from the beginning. So, so I'm a little bit biased about it. But my view is that organization is a result of apostasy doesn't mean that organization in 1863 was wrong because they needed to organize but they needed to organize because they were laodicean and we can see that why did why did god allow israel to have a king
Well, they wanted one. They had rejected him as a king, right? Right. Okay. So in the Adventist church, when it organized, organization was necessary, but it's because the people were in rebellion, right? They weren't listening to Ellen White. They were, um, the leadership was in rebellion, right? The ministers. And, and you know, every man did that which was right in his own eyes, so to speak, right? It, it, it organization just was the fact that if they didn't organize, the church wouldn't survive. It would break off into all kinds of different factions. And actually, we see that happening even early on in Adventism, that there are different groups that split off from um, the Adventists. Right. A lot of those developed into uh, other groups, in a sense, Ellen White's group, I mean, like James and Ellen White's group was just one faction among, among many, right? So there was lots of different uh, groups, different parties, uh, even after 1863, different groups were, um, and I can't remember when the Marian Party started, but the Marian Party, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the Marian Party, but they developed into um, sort of indirectly into the Worldwide Church of God. Uh, Herbert W. Armstrong's group. So he was influenced by people from the Marian party. And, and so there was a rejection of the spirit of prophets. You also see seventh day. Um, uh, let me see what they're called. No, I'm trying to think what they're called. Can't think of the name of the group. Um, uh, now Armstrong's group went back to Sunday worship too. Yeah, though the people still survived as Sabbath keepers. They just had to form a new organization. Um, just can't think of the other group. Um, anyway, I, I've been to one of their churches. It was one of their churches not far from here. But anyway, they, they were an offshoot of Adventism too, rejecting spirit of prophecy. So... Um, Anyway, the point is here that we have um, organization is the result of, of apostasy. So they, they needed organization in order to bring the church into some kind of unity so that it could expand and grow, so that it could do evangelistic work. Um, but... When they organized, that the purpose was not to control doctrine. And, you know, it wasn't to have, uh, you know, the Catholic sort of institution that uh, uh, controls every aspect of the work. It was just a way of helping, helping the body to function. So there was some good things about organization, and Ellen White supports it in 1863. But it's because of the condition of the church. And the church doesn't really get much better. I mean, obviously, um, the building up of that church is, is sort of a failure in a reform line, in a sense. So it has to go through the progressive destruction of four uh, before the first angel's message arrives again. So, so when we look at this message in our history... I, I didn't understand the logic of where we were in the lines. That is, were we actually in apostasy within this movement that we had to organize? I mean, we're definitely not 1863 in the movement, in the repeat of Millerite history. Now, there was an argument made um, to the degree that uh, in, in Millerite history itself, there is a type of organization that is when the Protestants close their doors to the Adventists. The Adventists before were part of the churches and um, they were now being kicked out. And that's one of the reasons uh, that we see this move towards camp meetings. Right. And so the idea is, well, we can't speak in the churches anymore, but we can set up a tent and a series of meetings. Um, 
in all these different towns and cities that we go to and and present the you know with these revival uh, meetings um, present the Adventist message and so that's what happened so now that to me wouldn't really be organization the type of organization that was being uh, suggested by Parminder now one of the problems that they they were having is they were having in other countries people being kicked out of the churches that they were in right so in africa and other places they couldn't attend their churches and so the idea was well in millerite history that happened so we need to organize but they didn't really organize as a church in millerite history i mean it was a movement not not a church it wasn't the Millerite Church. I mean, they did have conferences and things like that. Um, but these were just, you know, meetings where they came together to try to figure out exactly what, what they needed to do to work together. But we wouldn't call that a church. So this idea that we needed a new church, and specifically the idea that we were going to be calling Adventists out of Adventism into this church made no sense as a parallel of history. Now, I mean, a person could argue, they could say, well, 9-11 represents, you know, the arrival of the second angel's message. And um, so people have been kicked out of their churches. And so we're going to, you know, and we're going to, uh, you know, create this new organization. But, but that's not really what happens in Millerite history, right? So prior to October 22, 1844, we don't really see a, a church being organized. We just have meetings. There's a movement that's organized. So it's an organized movement. Now, the other thing is, um, you know, this idea of the baptismal vows that never really sat well with me. And the idea that we actually had to be rebaptized in order to join in this movement. Now, that was based upon Ellen White um, was baptized, right? But I, I don't know if historically um, that really makes much sense in the context of where we where we are. So, um, so part of what happens is we're going to look at... Uh, yeah, there's there's so much that that we've forgotten. So, do we know how Jeff paralleled um, uh, the time after October 22 with regard to the Sabbath and marriage? Right, those are going to occur after October 22. How does he place that in our line? Do we place marriage and the Sabbath in our history? And where do we place it? Anybody knows? We need to place it in this, but uh, as to where, would we not be placing it somewhere from uh, 2019 to 2022? Okay. Um, well, I, well, the question is, where did Jeff place it? How did he do that? How did he take marriage in the Sabbath? And he actually placed it first in 2015. All right. But that wasn't part of your question. You didn't ask where Jeff placed it, yeah. you asked where we should place it. Okay. Well, I don't think I was asking where we should place it. Where did we place it? Um, so, I mean, I don't, uh, it, the, see, the logic that they had back then, you know, in 2014, 15, 16, 17, as they started to understand the lines, especially as Parminder started to influence when we see in 2017 and, and actually in 16 when he becomes an elder. So, so he becomes an elder. So first thing is in 2016, we're going to have these elders. Marco, Tavo, and Parminder. And, and they're supposed to mark, I guess, areas. 
So Tabu would be like the elder in, in Canada and, and also Africa, because he's from Africa, but lives in Canada. Uh, Jeff, of course, would be the elder in uh, the United States and North America and just sort of general. Parminder would have uh, Europe and uh, South America and would be Marco sort of thing in Central America. Yeah, so I, I don't know. Um, and Angela, I think, put a comment there that, yeah, so there was stuff dealing with marriage and and the Sabbath. So we're going to have those. Now, what about Ellen White's baptism? Like, how did we get the idea of baptism? So we have baptism talked about. Um, so they're going to introduce this baptism, these baptismal vows. Right, because remember, so organization, we first get the altar in 2016. We have, um, we have the camp meeting in Italy in 2017. It's not an organizational camp meeting. Um, uh, that one's going to be in... Now I always forget whether it's Romania. I think it's in Romania in 2017 in September of 2000. Was Romania. Yeah. So what, the reason I was invited to speak in 2017 to teach classes at the School of the Prophets is they have School of the Prophets um, classes, but most of the teachers were in Romania, right? That would include, you know, Parminder. Um, Jeff, all these people in Romania, and they're doing this organizational stuff. And I'm, I'm not sure particularly about how long Jeff was there. Um, it seems to be, you know, Parminder seemed to be in charge there. And, I, you know, somebody has to correct me about, about uh, Jeff's participation there. Because I remember him being at the School of the Prophets when I was there. So I think he was there for a bit of the time, but not the whole time. And that's going to be in 2017. That's going to be the camp meeting where uh, Chowatu and, and Kimberly um, arrive on, on, on a, in a carriage with horses. And, um, and there's a lot made about that, that he's, you know, believes he's Samuel Snow, which I think he did. But, he said that wasn't the reason they came in, in horses and nothing to do with it. He wasn't thinking that way, but it was interpreted that he was thinking that way. But um, Parminder is going to have a meeting with Chowatu and Kimberly and give a completely different story than Chowatu and Kimberly give. And the followers of Parminder, um, they believe Parminder's account uh, but they don't believe Chawatu and Kimberly's account. And they point to inconsistencies in Chawatu's and Kimberly's account about what Parminder said uh, to them. But basically, Parminder kicked them out of the movement. That's what they said. Um, but a lot of this, when you talk to the people who were following Parminder, they only tell you what Parminder said that Ch Chawatu and Kimberly said. Um, so even if their stories were inconsistent, the only witness you have of that is Parminder telling you that their stories are inconsistent. So the followers of Parminder don't actually know what happened at all. They just simply accept Parminder's explanation. But um, there was a, a bunch of stuff that went on at that camp meeting. So when they came back, because I'm at the School of the Prophets in September, uh, when they got back from this organizational meeting in Romania, um, it was all secretive. Nobody was to know what had happened because there was not unanimous votes. Uh, this was all to be kept secret. And that's something I have a hard time with. I don't believe anything should be done in secret that has to do with God's church. 
right? That is, you don't have secret meetings. You don't, you don't hide anything. Everything needs to be done in the open so that all can see, right? right? It has to be completely transparent because when you have things in secret, that's, that's Satan's method. So, so I wasn't really too impressed with that, but, um, we know that it you're going to have this darkness that is related to this organization of parminders. So when we look at this um, this symbol of Cicero, so so we've derived all of these different symbols um, from these verses themselves. So we use you know verse numbers Hebrew. Uh, uh, numbers, uh, the meanings of names, right? Uh, when we deal with uh, Sisera, we can't remember now all of these things. Battle array, that's what his name means. And we have Jabin, who is, his name means intelligent, uh, but literally God, whom God observes, right? So it's related to the word of all seeing, like knowledge. Uh, he's the king of Canaan. Canaan, of course, is the son of Ham. Uh, that reigned in Hazor. Um, Hazor means castle. So we can see that, that this here is... Basically, papalism, right? And Cicero represents, or Parminder's message, represents the papal, papal spirit. So when I say organization, what the organization that Parminder is presenting is really a papal organization, correct? Yeah, that's what we, I think we determined. Yeah, okay. And, and he dwells in Haroshet, um, that's the woodland of the Goyim, right, the nations, the Gentiles. Um, so, um, the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. So one of the things we look at is this 20 years as a symbol, right? So, so we look at the 20 years, and I can't remember if I put that chart in here. I do it this way. No, okay. No, I might have it in my other one. Okay, so, so the 20 years, what are the 20 years, if we can remember? Anybody remember where we what we did with the 20 years as a symbol? Sorry, bro, not my notes. <laughs> okay. Now we did address um Let me see here if I have this. Um, tried to remember it exactly myself. How we did that. Yeah. Um, I did it in some other way. Let's see if it's that. Uh, just I'm, I'm trying to search it ah is this it 
Okay, so the 20 years um, we related from uh, 2001 to um, 2021. I'm trying to remember exactly. Okay, that's what we did. So we took this as uh, 20 months was going to take us from, from uh, it's going to connect us to 2017 to, to 2019. Just trying to, I'm looking at my chart here, trying to figure it out. And we had 20 prophetic years um, as well. And uh, we also dealt with 200 months. So I think I have this in the other diagrams yeah so here's the chart um we'll switch to this So when we dealt with September 11th, 2001, um, and this is going to relate to um, the 395 days. So we have this period of time that goes from September 11th, 2001 to um, 2030, right? We have two different ways, the 354 months. And, and in doing that, when we use that chart, we actually came to um, from August 22nd, 2001. So that's the, the first month that September 11th is in. And the 200th month brings us to September 23rd, 2017. Now, we're saying that that 200th month is re represented by the 20 years. Now, we can also count from September 11th, 2001, and count to January 15th, 2018, and that's going to be prophetic months. And, and that's going to be 114 days after September 23rd, 2017. So the difference there is 114 days because of the initial 21 days at the beginning Um so the difference is if you take 21 from there, you get 93. And the difference between uh, 200 lunar months and 200 prophetic months is 93 days, if that makes sense. I think that's correct. So 200. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Now, we also have the 20 prophetic years, and that's going to bring us uh, from September 11th to May 29th, 2021. And what's the significance there of May uh, 21, 20, uh, May 29th, 2021? Is there any significance of it? From May 29th, 2021, 216 days remain to the end of the year. Also, uh, 209 days between May 29th and the 20th day of the ninth month, December 25th, 2021. So it's just bringing us to, uh, and it's 105 days um, from May 29th to, you can't really see it here, to September 11th, 2021. So the 20 years of of um from september 11th 2001 to september 11th 2021 we can see that there is this this these symbols that are here now we also have um this is this is a rather complex structure whether it's i, I don't think we can just remember this i can't there's too many little details but we have 
200 months and 20 months. They're 30 day months. So this is a restoration. So September 11th, 2001, we have 9-11 as a message. And September 7th, 2019 is 220 prophetic months from September 11th, 2001. And September 7th, 2019, that's when Jeff uh, presents the last presentation at Lambert Church when he awakes from his rest, when he his five-month retirement, and that's going to be the sixth day of the sixth month on the biblical calendar, and September 7th, that's nine times seven is 63. It's 63 days before November 9th, right? And it's 360 months from November 9th, 1989, to November 9th, 2019. That's just Julian or Gregorian calendar months, right? So it's 20 years times 12 is, uh, pardon me, 30 years times 12. So that's 30 years times 12 is 360. Um, right, so we can see all of these, these symbols. We have symbols of the Sunday law of 666, 216 is 6 times 6 times 6. Uh, that made uh, 29th, 2021 is the 16th day of the second month on the biblical calendar. So that's one, two, six, the symbols there, or of two sixteen, right? So this second month, 16th day, it's gonna go to January 1st, 2022. Um, this was a symbol of the Sunday law, December 25th, 2021. So this 20, and it's the 20th day of the ninth month. So, so you start to see how this is all fitting together. So what what is this 20 years? representing from 2001 to 2021 it's going to represent uh the end of our line our 777 structure but it's connected to uh this levitical chiasm structure that we have in this story of deborah and sisera right that makes sense yes yes it does Let's see. Okay, so it's rather complex, <laughs> but but the idea here is when we get to this September twenty third, twenty seventeen date, that this date is connected to a message that's responding to this organization of Parminder. Does that make sense? Could you repeat that, please? So this September 23rd, 2017 date, when I present at Lambert Church, uh, I present um, July 18th as a symbol of the prediction before midnight. I don't realize it at the time, but I'm actually presenting a message that sets in motion a series of events and a structure that answers to this darkness of organization of Parminder, right? This organizational darkness. So Parminder's, Parminder's darkness, the, the darkness of Sisera, is this papal organization. And <clears throat> now I put here September 7, uh, September 2017. That's when they have um, so this is Romania, I guess I could put, I don't know the exact dates. I do know um, that it is connected to September 11th, 2017, that there is some stuff there. I know I first present on September 11th in um, 2017, and I'm going to end on September 23rd. That is, uh, I believe I was scheduled from September 11th to September 22nd or something like that. Um, that is, I did uh, the Vespers or something on the 22nd, if I remember correctly. And then on the 23rd, I, I could be getting that wrong. But on the 23rd, I know that I present at Lambert Church. And 
and I'm pretty sure that my first presentations are September 11th, but I could be wrong too. I could be getting confused in 2018. But anyway, um, in September of 2017, they have these meetings in Romania. Now, I'm going to present, of course, Samuel Snow's letters. Parminder, when he gets back from Romania, he's going to um, present studies regarding the nature of man. And, and I'm there for the beginning of those that series. So um, I know that when I'm there and Parminder is presenting, um, he didn't want me to say very much during his class. And his reason was I knew a lot and he was trying to teach the class. He didn't want me answering the questions. But basically the answers that I would give would contradict what he's saying. Um, and... Uh, so, so it's not just about organization, but it is about organization um, because he's using a deceptive method of teaching, which we would have to call a Jesuit method. I'm not saying that he's a Jesuit, um, but he's definitely influenced by that, the, the methods of the Jes Jesuits. He's using uh, deception, right? And, uh, you know, so he's, he's using an imposture as far as, as, as what he believes. And um, he's trying to introduce, contrary to his words, he's trying to introduce um, ideas that he knows the movement won't accept. So he's not open about what he's trying to introduce, because then people would be aware of it. So he's... He's using the cloak of darkness. So, <clears throat> so that's this line of Deborah and Brack. We start it with September 23rd, 2017. So we're saying that a message arrives there. And we're going to say that this is an invitation. So um, if we go back to this. And hopefully, you know, going through this a few times like this does help us. Now the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. Now, what did we do with the 900 ch chariots of iron? So we got the 20 years. We're going to know that it's this period of oppression that, um, that comes from Parminder. The Par Parminder is part of the movement prior to 9-11, by the way. But um, so what's the 900 chariots? Did we ever decide on what that symbol meant? I don't recall that we did. Yeah, I, I don't remember anything about it. The, the thing that's interesting about the word nine itself, um, according to Brown Drivers Briggs, it comes from uh, a word that means to, to turn. And it could be just that you're going through. Oh, okay. There was 900 chariots, and I missed that there in the chat. Um, so 900 chariots, the gematria, the normal sum, sum is 209. So again, we get that 20th day of the ninth month, that Sunday law symbol that we have. But it's also the symbol from Ezra, right? So that's going to be um, the 20th day of the ninth month. And it's like 20 years and nine nine hours or 900? Okay, I see what you're saying. 20 years and 900. Hmm. Okay, so we got the 20 and the nine there in the nine, 20 and nine, right? 900. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so it relates us to the end of the line, right? So we remember that when we look at 
this line um, of Deborah and Barak, it's going to be the 777 days from September 23rd, 2017 to November 9th, 2019, right? But we know that that is, um, it's addressing that battle with Parminder's message, with Sisera, right? But it's going to produce a message that's going to address the next 777 days from November 9th to December 25th, 2021. And, and that message is going to be the message of Gideon, right? So Gideon is going to be that next message. But Deborah and Brack is the formalization of the message of Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. So we're still addressing these errors that are left in the land. And um, so that we have this 20th day of the ninth month, that, that, is, that is our message, right? So in, in some ways, it's this battle with Sisera that's represented in these first 777 days. So we'll, we'll see that as we go through this. But, but thanks for that, Iran. That's... Uh, very helpful. Now, sometimes we can take a number and we can represent it as a period of days. Now, if you took 900 and you divide it by 360, you just get 2.5. So it's not anything um, a particular interest in that in that regard. I mean, I don't know what 2.5 would mean. And if you divide it by 365.25, um, you'll get 246, 2.46406570840, right? So you're going to get numbers that, you know, could relate to the 26th day of the fourth month, but in a different order. Um, obviously, if you divided it by 30, that's pretty simple. You would get 30. So it can be a symbol of months, 30 months. Um, If you divide it by um, 29.53, you're going to get um, you know, 30.47. Um, it's a little bit more than the actual length of a, a Gregorian month. So whatever that particularly means. Um, but, you know, if we had it as... 30 months, you know, it's, it's two and a half years, right? So whether that fits in somewhere, I don't know, but I, I do like the, the 20 and the nine. Okay. And so we, we, we understand that Deborah, she's a prophetess, the wife of Lapidus, and she judged Israel at that time. So this is going to address FFA, right? So FFA, which is God's organization, God's movement, right, is going to come against Parminder. But it, it takes time for this, this battle to happen, right? So for one is um, Parminder's using these deceptive methods. And so, I mean, the answer to Parminder is going to be this 777 structure. Yeah, um, so we have here the iron, right? Um, iron chariots, multiples of 30 common in judges and iron represents Rome, can refer to Leviticus 26, 19, heaven as iron. Chariots, military might as papacy using other nations military to advance its power, yes. So that would be the other thing about Parminder's um, message is that it's a papal method message. We have the iron, which represents the papacy. Right.
Yes. But we have symbols here that are going to actually represent our message in contrast to Parminder's message. So this, this is the conflict between the strange wives, the 20th day of the ninth month in Ezra chapter 10. Right. But so now we have Deborah, which means a B, and of course we connected that to FFA to the School of the Prophets more specifically, which is on Bumblebee Road, North Bumblebee Road. Now Parminder, um, he wants to usurp the King of the North, right? North Bumblebee, because Christ is the true King of the North, right? He sits on the sides of the north, the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north, which uh, Satan wants to occupy. And one of the things that Parminder wants is he wants the school of the prophets. Right. That was part of uh, uh, the problem that uh, Bronwyn had is she wanted to control the school of the prophets. That's why she left um, Germany in 2019 because she didn't get what she wanted right she believed that she needed to be in control of that but she had she had bought into the arguments of parminder right the pant wearing and all that stuff right So she had really been working with Parminder, but then turned on Parminder at the last minute. Now, so this message, of course, this is a message that comes from FFA. So this is a prophetess. That's the school of the prophets. The wife of Lapidus. Now, what was the idea of Lapidus? means torches. We connected this with Ellen White, correct? Yes. Okay. Because it means a lamp or a flame. Yeah, I believe that's what we decided. Yeah, and Ellen White means a bright and shining light. So it, it relates to Ellen White. Um, now, it's the wife of Lapidoth, but Lapidoth just represents the spirit of prophecy here. So, right. so we're based on the spirit of prophecy. Parminder's message is not. He's going to reject the spirit of prophecy. And Deborah is this judge, right? And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah. So the palm tree is going to be a symbol of the 2520, right? Because Jericho is the city of palm trees. So we see a palm tree in this context um, of, of judges. We recognize it as a symbol of the 2520. So she dwells under the palm tree between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim. So that is um, this idea of between that would represent a structural chiasm. And Rama, what was Rama? So it's lots of different places. This would be a, a, a fortified city in Naphtali in this context. Or would it be the town in Benjamin on the border of Ephraim, about five miles from Jerusalem? Because we got Bethel as well. Bethel's in northern Israel. <clears throat> so where was where was this? Well, Rama is also isn't that also tied with Samuel? Um. I don't know. Uh, the home place of Samuel located yes, in the country of Ephraim. Yeah. So okay. Now, 
the the issue that we're dealing with here <clears throat> when we have Bethel being approached of course we recognize that as being the house of God right Rama um, depending on hill. how huh it means hill okay I'm I'm also or a high at, seat high place uh, lofty a place right? idolatry, a seat of idolatry Right. So these are two contrasting places. Correct. One is the house of God. One is the house of idols. Right. And, and of idols, it, right. Yeah. And even if we look at the verse, Judges 4, verse 5, uh, that's the fifth day of the fourth month. That's midnight. And we, we've also got 45 on the 1843 chart. Yeah. But I think of midnight as, as the center of a chiasm. Correct. And, Chiasm, you know, so you have idolatry on the one side and the house of God on the other. Right. So you have this chiasm, that this, and this is the battle between Parminder's movement, his organization, his way of worshiping, and the true way of worshiping that this movement represents. Okay. Now, the children of Israel came up to her for judgment, that is, to Deborah. And we can see that that would represent the school of the prophets in FFA. Right? In this movement. So were there actually three Ramas in the Bible? E yeah, well, at least... There's a landmark on the boundary of Asher between Tyre and Sidon. There's a fortified city of Naphtali. There's Joshua, more. Joshua 19.8, you have Rama of Simeon. Okay. Yeah, there's more, more than one. Okay. How many more? I don't know. But uh, I have here six. Um, okay. In Brown's Driver's Briggs. There's six oh. listed. So if that if that was the case, six being the number of man, is this symbolic of the apostasies that Israel had in turning to idols rather than turning to God? Yeah, it could be. Now, uh, regarding Judges 4, one Iran has said that if we look at um, a Bible verse, so that means it's it, the Bible verse is 6,601st Bible verse. That would represent FFA, six representing F and one representing A. So, so we can see the symbols here connecting us with FFA. So this is a battle over the control of, of the movement. And Parminder has proposed this new organization Right. So that's what what he's done. And but we have this chiasm. Ramoth and Bethel and Deborah dwells between them under the palm tree. So we can see the 2520 structure, but it's represented um, in this in this contrast between idol worship, which would be Parminder or Sisera's message and um, Bethel, the house of God. You know, so what, um, you know, God's true organization. Now, she's going to make an invitation. So, um, so when we look at the chart that we had constructed, all of this is representing the period of darkness, right? So all of these verses up to verse 5. So we probably should put that in in the chart because um, we hadn't we hadn't done that when we went through it the first time. So I'm going to put these at the bottom. We just say that this is uh, Judges four verse one to five. Okay, well, I probably don't need to put Judges. I'll just put verse four one to five. Okay, and then we have this invitation. This is going to be 
4, verse 6. So that invitation is, and she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinuim, out of Kadesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go, draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulun? So, now, now that's interesting. She sent and called Brack and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor? Right, so she gives this as a question so that he must know the answer, right? It's, it's a rhetorical question. And I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon and Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. So, so we had in our chart there, uh, we have this invitation and we're saying that that's September 23rd, 2017. So, so why would we say that that's the invitation? So remember, Deborah represents a message, even though we're saying it represents FFA. It's the message of FFA is sending an invitation. The date again? September 23rd, 2017. Now, remember, I'm invited to this camp, this uh, school of the prophets to teach. So this is the first time I'm invited to teach. I, I was invited to camp meetings, but as the teacher at the school of the prophets, this is the first invitation that I have personally. So, so there's an invitation to me personally that's connected with this. Um, but what else? What, why would we put this as this particular date? Now, so we have Barak, the son of Abinoam, that's the father of pleasantness, and he's going to be uh, called out of Kadesh Naphtali. Okay, so, so that's, I, found what, I found that 23rd, what we were doing, or what we thought about, that was the presentation that you made about the July 18th symbol. Right. That was the prediction before midnight. Right. Now, now Parminda rejects the prediction before midnight. Right. So in 2017, 2017 is a pretty busy year, but in 2017, um, you know, I'm going to, at the beginning of the year, I'm going to find out about the chiasm in Ezra 7 to 10, actually at the end of uh, 2016 to beginning of 2017. I go to see, um, I actually go to um, Eatonville in February and see Jeff presenting there. And I actually present to him and the group the chiasms from the story of, of um, uh, Ezra, right? Now, of course, I'm invited to teach at the School of the Prophets in 2017 later in the year, but lots ends up happening in the message. We have this prediction before midnight uh, being taught, right? Uh, we also have Rafi and Paniam introduced on January 14th in Alberta, right? And the pandemic, right, in 2017. Then I see Jeff at Eatonville. Um, then we have uh, Parminder doing presentations um, in uh, Alberta in the spring. I think that's in April. Um you know, I travel to Eatonville again in the summer and do presentations on the structure of prophetic chronology. Um, uh, 
And that's what I'm going to be presenting. Let me think here. Um, that's actually what I'm going to present in 2017 is um, I'm going to present Samuel Snow's letters. I'm trying to think how this how this goes. Um, yeah, actually, I'm going to present Samuel Snow's letters and the structure of prophetic chronology in 2017. So, so there's a lot that goes on in 2017 uh, in that meeting. So I'm going to go through um, uh, the paper that I wrote on the structure of prophetic chronology and into Samuel Snow's letters. So it's, um, it's going to be in 2018 that I present uh, Ezra 7 to 10. Um, so I, no, and, and then I'm going to present the week of Christ as well. I'm just trying to remember all the different things here. So, <clears throat> so we're just saying that this invitation in 2017, uh, is an invitation to the movement, right? Uh, but what's the invitation about? So we have we have the organization aspect that is that is connected to this darkness. So what is September 23rd, 2017 inviting? Who is it inviting? And, and why does that message on Samuel Snow's letters with the July 18 uh, symbol as the prediction before midnight, what does that have to do with the arrival of the first message? How is that the invitation? Remember, uh, September 23rd is the Feast of Trumpets. Okay. So when uh, Aran just notes, he says, partway through watching that presentation, when he watched it personally, there had been 391 views before he had watched it. Um, and when was that that you watched it, Iran? Was, and was that on the FFA site? It's on the Lambert site. Uh, Lambert. It, yeah. We'd have the date because I think I sent you a message on WhatsApp when that happened. Yeah. yeah. I just don't. Yeah. So that wasn't that long ago. That was within the last year or so, right? Yeah. Okay, so Naphtali, of course, has to do with rush, wrestling. I don't know what sanctum means. Kadesh means city. City of Naphtali. <clears throat> but, but the Feast of Trumpets is an invitation, is it not? And we saw the trumpet blowing... Um, in, in other lines, represented September 23rd. Because we have that in um, <clears throat> Judges 3.27 with the trumpet that Ehud blows. And that's going to be September 23rd. So can we see that the trumpet is this connected to this invitation? Well, it appears that way. Okay. I mean, have I just arbitrarily picked September 23rd, 2017? You know, I mean, because there's lots that happens in 2017. <clears throat> 
is there any other way that we can connect this to um, so I guess probably what I should put here is put the trumpet in there Okay, so um, and we have this. Um, he's going to. Deborah says that she will draw um, Sisera to the river Kaishan, which means winding. And it comes from uh, the word kosh, which means to bend uh, or to set a trap, lay a snare. So she's going to lay a trap for him at the place that's a trap, right? The bending, the winding. So Sisera, the captain of Javan's army, is going to be drawn there with his chariots and his multitude. And I will deliver him into thine hand. So Naphtali and Zebulun are both going to be together here. So remember that we... Um, we had Odilia using the number of the tribe of Zebulun, right? He's going to count from, what is it, May 23rd, 1863, 57,400 days to July 18th. So we see Zebulun connected with Naphtali, and with Naphtali, what did we do? What did we do with Naphtali? So Naphtali, we connected to the falling of the stars, November 13th, 1833. That's going to bring us to 1980. So January 27th, 1980, if we count 53,400 days, which is um, 1,780 prophetic months. Fifty-three thousand four hundred, and and then there's going to be one hundred ninety-seven days to my conversion on August eleventh, nineteen eighty. January twenty-seventh is ten days before my sixteenth. Um, what is that? Seventeenth birthday, yeah, and four. 14,587 days, the falling of the manna to July 18th. So we can use Naphtali to connect to my history, dealing with the falling of the stars in my time. So it's going to bring us to the year of the falling of the stars. And from the falling of the stars that I personally witnessed on my conversion, we have the number of days that the manna falls that leads us to July 18th. So um, just to see this here on this chart, this is the chart. We have the Zebulun that's going to connect us to May 23rd, 1863. Now, remember what Odilia does in this study, the tokens, harbingers and sign, harbingers and signs, is he's going to take um, the Lisbon earthquake, the dark day and the falling of the stars. And he's going to look at the spans of time 
to July 18th, and he's going to find these symbols uh, that connect to um, July 18th, right? So he's going to find these symbols, and he's going to find them also in the spans of time in these periods themselves, 78 years and 12 days from November 1st, 1755 to November 13th, 1833, now, 1833 also marks the year of uh, William Miller's ordination, and and so we can we can sort of connect the, this history here in the falling of the stars with our history. I also connect in other lines uh, the Japanese earthquake um, uh, as well, because it's going to be on March 11th. And it's going to be, uh, there's 311 days from uh, something, I can't remember. But, but the point is, we can take this history, Zebulun and Naphtali are connected, is all I'm really trying to say here. There's a lot of other things here. But they're connected in that they connect this history. So this is an addition to... Odilio study that was fitting in with my study of looking at the man of folly. So it ties together this history. And so in this history then of judges, Deborah and Barak, uh, we have Naphtali and Zebulun tied together. And they're used to defeat Sisera. So what do Zebulun and Naphtali represent that defeats Sisera in the way that they're used by Odilio and, and me? What does it represent? How is this battle being waged? Again? Messages. Yeah, it's messages regarding chronology. Right. Symbolic use of numbers, right? Now, I always find it... I find it odd that uh, Parminder and Tess are going to use chronology to initially gain control of the movement, but they're going to abandon it. That They're not going to continue using chronology in the way that we do. They're going to use it to get what they want, but they're going to abandon it, right? So they definitely would not approve of our symbolic use of numbers as we are using them. Because if they did, they would come up with July 18, 2020. And then when they even create the date of November 9th, 2019, they're not creating it correctly. That is, they arrive at that date because they, they notice some of these symbolic dates but they're going to abandon these symbolic dates. You're not going to see them using them in their later studies after they're split with this movement. They're just going to abandon a whole bunch of things that they were doing before. And they're going to use more a, um, a parable teaching type of idea. They draw lots of pictures and, and, and find significance from analogies. So it's something that they can easily bend to whatever they want. So, so we've taken the position that the chronology is objective. That doesn't mean that there isn't any subjective elements, right? Because there are, but, but it does give us an objective measure that we can uh, apply to our understanding of these verses, and especially when we place it line upon line as we have done. So um, one of the things that we see that's, that's lacking in Colin and Odilio's studies, because they're using chronology and they get the right dates, but they haven't drawn out their lines like we are here, right? No, for sure, no. Right. So they've introduced things that are 
our wheels, that is, they're part of our structure, of our chronology, of our history at the present time, what's, what's happening. But they're not placed in the proper context to interpret what they mean. And that's not a criticism of Odilio or Colin. It's, it's just, just something that we found out because of all this stuff. Right. So because we've spent time looking at these lines, understanding that there are symbols and dates, but that in order to interpret the significance of those dates, we need to have a line. And that line needs to come from scripture. So, so we could have all kinds of dates and we could find all kinds of structures. I mean, if we could organize dates, we could choose things because people do this all the time. The Protestants do it all the time, the evangelicals, uh, dispensationalists, and they'll connect events with dates, but they have nothing to guide them. That is, they don't have line upon line. And, and so the meaning of that, of what they find, is completely subjective. They can just create whatever story they want, and we can't do that. Right. We have to. We have to follow. We're constrained by Miller's rules. Right. Yeah. And Miller's rules. So you know we can talk about Miller's rules, but we know that this movement is guided line upon line, which is which comes from Miller's rules. That is, it's implied in Miller's rules. Because when we look at a story in the Bible, that story follows the same pattern. It is a symbol. Right. Millerite history itself is a symbol. It's a, it's a template that we can compare all other histories. This is how we came to this conclusion is it's because of the Millerites and their and how they by studying their history. So yeah. we can apply it to our history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, so as we're looking at this, you know, we can see we have this invitation. Uh, we're saying that it's September 23rd, 2017. And, and part of that is because of this whole story where, where it leads. But also each of these waymarks um, fit into a structure, right? So we can see here we have the Levit, the uh, the Levitical chiasm part of it, this 126 days. We're going to have to look at this um, on Sunday. Today's Thursday, right? So on Sunday, we will look at this in a bit more detail, obviously, this Levitical structure and, and how to understand this line that's, that's within these 777 days. Why, why we're even going to look at this 777 days from September 23rd, part of it has to do with, with what's following after this date, September 23rd. That is, its, its significance is only found when we look at these other dates. And um, so let me see here. Something. Okay, so I need to put that in there. So one of the things I do, and, and I suggest people do this. So I did this with uh, Shamgar, and and this was done by Ron with uh, the line of Jephthah. Is I actually make a chart. Well, I just copy it. So I just put all the dates we have in a line and I put them in the calendar converter. And so this is what I had done for um, uh, the line of Shamgar. I put all the dates that we have there to see if there was anything that I would notice, right? And, you know, sometimes there, there one interesting thing here is if you go, now, this isn't really part of the line, but this is that that uh, 777 days from my birthday. 
back to uh, the Mayan date, which is 77 days from when the, that line begins. Um, it's kind of interesting that it's 525 days, uh, which would be an inclusive count from that August 31st, 2013 date. So August 13, 2013, that's when uh, Jeff presents Ezra 7-9 as a question. How do we figure this out? And, and that's going to be 525 inclusive days for when I turn 52, which is part of that structure. And, and that's going to be after my 52nd birthday, it's going to be 525 days. So that's an exclusive count to the presentation of Ezekiel um, and Revelation 9 being connected. So that's going to be the presentation on uh, July 16th, 2016. So it's kind of interesting. It's, it's halfway between those two dates. So August 13th, 2013 to uh, July 16th, 2016 is 525 and 525 with my birthday, 52nd birthday in the middle. That makes sense. So we should do that with this other line that we have. I haven't done it yet. But, you know, if you want to practice, uh, use the calendar converter and take these dates that we have placed in this line uh, of Deborah and Barak and see if we notice anything. Okay. So it's just a suggestion. Okay. Any final thoughts? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Before we close with prayer. Okay. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study here um, this morning. I pray that you can continue to be with us. We ask for your healing hand upon us for those that are suffering health issues. And we pray, Lord, that we can receive blessings from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.